You can put in a sort of narrative of you know, what you think is your summary evidence. Some people will put in, even though it's not necessary, a summary table of the evaluation scores. Again, it's up to you. Yeah. If that's not in your official path, you could include it. And you have a right to do your own evaluations. You can do a mid-semester eval, which is not university required, but you may put it in if you think. And basically what you're doing is, and Harry says, your PIF is not a garbage dump. It's not something you throw everything in. Even though it's great that you get them, you don't need an inch thick of thank you notes from students. They won't help make your case. So keep it to things that are relevant. And if you think something is relevant, put it in or ask, do you think I should put this in? It could be syllabi, it could be sample exams, it could be any number of things. I, in a couple of my classes, for example, I have a fairly comprehensive term paper. I put in the instructions for the term paper in addition to my syllabus so they can see what I'm requiring of my students. Uh, if you've done some professional development to improve your teaching, you can include some evidence of that. Don't include the whole program of a conference you attended, though. Just kind of make a note or a list of it. So when you say a syllabus, like a syllabus If you teach a range of classes, show the range of the syllabi that you have. What do you do with The most recent one. And again, it's not, a, it's not a collection bin. It's, a, it's an argument for you. Realize that human nature tells me, at least, that the farther they read into the PIF, the less careful they are. Put the important stuff up front. That's why that narrative at the beginning is very important. Reviewers, especially at the college level, where they may be reading 20 or 30 of these things in the spring, if they got ones this thick, make it like this, make it easy on them, and tell your story the way you want it told. No, no, if they give permission. Yeah, because they own it. They can't do it while it's in the review cycle, but once they get it back and you'll get your PIF back. I mean, I've loaned my, I loaned my PIF to any number of people over the years because somebody told me it was a pretty good one. So they borrowed it and said, oh, that was helpful. In fact, I, t I have my little template sheets there where I filled in and put all the stuff in. I took out all my information and sent them a file with my template outline. I didn't care if it helps them. And another question, just to kind of couple the, or look at the broad picture of all this. You, you're, you're not evaluated in your first physical year here. You will all, next fall, all but will be coming up for your, they call it a second year review. You'll be turning in your PIF probably in early October. And it, but that's department specific, but it should be in October sometime. Because the department has to have the DPC, which is Department Personnel Committee, the DPC has to review your PATH and your PIF. And they, they're actually required to invite you to meet with them. I don't know why anybody would decline that invitation, but the requirement is to invite the faculty member. They can't require you to meet with them. Subtle difference, but interesting one I found. So you, can, you probably will meet with the committee to explain things and see how you're doing. The department, the DPC and the department chair then write a letter and they're pretty templatish. That's not a word it is now. They're <laughs> template driven. They follow the five steps of professional preparation, teaching effectiveness, blah, 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 down the line. They will inform you at the end of that that you have 10 days to review it before it goes to the next level. You have a right to respond in writing and you have a right to request a meeting with them to discuss it. Sometimes things there are, they're modified based on the conversation or the committee or the chair can say, I hear what you're saying, my letter stands. But your rebuttal statement now goes into your path with their evaluation and goes forward. So at the college level, they're reading both sides of the story. So in the second year, this year, I think it was October 25th, you had to receive, the, first, the second year people had to receive their letter by October 25th from the DPC and the department chair. 
Ten days later, it goes up to the college level where the dean and the college personnel committee start their review. Their letters to the candidates, I think this year were due early December, something December 2nd or 3rd, something like that. You then have ten days from there to respond and request a meeting for that one. Then they go up to the provost level, which the second year files now are in the provost's office and he's going through all of them with some assistance from our office. Uh, and then the second year faculty will get their letters from the provost, I think it's February 15th, if I recall correctly. And the calendar for all of those things is, and this is a useful one to look up for a lot of reasons, in the back of section 600 every year there is the academic year calendar of personnel procedures. This gives the deadline for second year, for three through six, for sabbatical applications, for a whole bunch of stuff. So you can follow the bouncing ball here in terms of when you might expect to receive things. If you're year three through six, which you may be this next year, uh, then the whole time thing is shifted, somewhat depart department dependent, but usually PIFs are due mid-January. Some departments, though, want to get all this out of the way before the winter break. If you're in one of those departments, you may be due in but here in a department where it's before early December. Early December. Early yeah. December. Yeah. Some departments want to get it done early. So listen to your department on those deadlines. So for years three through six, the department has to give their letters by late January sometime and then 10 day waiting period. Then the college gets it. They give their letters. 10 day waiting period goes to the provost. Now, you're not, you are reviewed every year, but the provost doesn't review you every year. If you have, the provost reads your file in year two, four, and magic year six, which is the promotion and tenure year. If you get all positive recommendations at the department level and the college level, so that's four positive votes. In years three and five, the dean's letter stops the process. That doesn't go up to the provost. So if you're year three or year five saying, where's the letter from the provost? Where is it? Where is it? If you've gotten four positives, you're not going to get one. Don't ask. If there's a disagreement, if one or more of the four agencies recommends negative, then it goes to the provost in years three and five. Okay, back to your question of year one, year two. So you're, you're hired for a two-year probationary period. Unless you have multiple felonies, you'll probably make it to your second year. Multiple, uh, that's like one. Yeah, you can have one, maybe two. Well, just kidding for the tape there. Uh, then when you're evaluated in your second year, it's for retention for your third year. Rare is the case when people aren't retained after their second year. There are exceptions, but it's very, very rare. If you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, it should be fine. And the second year letters, if there are any emerging problems, even though they may recommend retention, they may start to say, and you want to get that research agenda going a little bit, or you got some things you got to work on on the teaching, you might want to talk to some people about that. So they can have gentle reminders there in year two. You're retained, but things to work on as you move to year three. Same for year four, five, and six. Retention, retention, retention. Until you reach tenure, you're considered to be a probationary faculty member. Now, do you have to wait six years for tenure? Not necessary, not necessarily, but probably. The criterion for early tenure, not early promotion, I'll get to that in just a second. The criterion for early tenure is that it's advantageous to the university. What the heck does that mean? You could have somebody come in and get three Nobel Prizes, have 45 publications, they're a superstar off the chart, but it still may, may not be in the interest of the university that you get early tenure. And we hear it almost every year. Somebody says, but I'm a superstar. Why won't you tenure me, tenure me early? Well, because you're in a large department. They've got plenty of tenured faculty. We don't need any more tenured faculty. <laughs> so you'll have to wait six years. Now, can you go up for early promotion? The answer is yes. That's, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's much easier to get early promotion than it is early tenure. And if you say, I really want the early tenure, really a non-issue. Because where does the pay increase come with the early promotion? Tenure doesn't carry any dollar value. It carries lifetime employment, so to speak. But 
Can you imagine a case where somebody would be promoted early and then not subsequently given tenure? I would find that really hard to believe, unless we get multiple felonies in between. <laughs> so if you're interested in the money side of it, it's a minimum 7.5% 7, 7 increase when you are promoted from assistant to associate and again from associate to full. The criterion for early promotion is have you completed all that is required in a time period shorter than six years? So if you think after four years, you've done everything you're supposed to do where they would grant you a promotion in year six. If you think so, then you may want to consider going up early for early promotion. I would recommend though, talk to your department chair, talk to your dean and say, do you think you would be, they can't guarantee it, do you think you would be supportive of early promotion? They are encouraging you to do so. There's really no downside to doing it. It won't be held against you in future years if you don't get it. And sometimes, you have to be prepared for a no. If you can't handle no, then don't do it. <laughs> Some people are sensitive and go, oh, they just shot me, I got, didn't get early promotion. But if you can handle that, and you think you've done everything, you don't have to do more, you just have to do what's required in a shorter period of time. Now, in terms of scholarship, that's pretty easy to tell, especially if your department says two publications and you've got two, well, I finished that one. In teaching though, a word of caution, and this is my experience going through the process, uh, or looking at the process for the last three years, is sometimes what you would do in six years is teach a, an array of courses. And you may not have taught that full array of courses in four years. That could be a reasonable argument for not giving early promotion, because you haven't done that has taught as many courses as you would have in six rather than four. So just be aware of that. But again, talk to your chair, talk to your dean, see if they'd be on your side, and then go for it if you can handle it now. Okay, any questions? Okay, let's move down now to the uh, third area, the scholarly publications. It's called Contributions to the Field of Study. This is scholarly work, and this will differ from department to department. If you're one of the hard sciences, physics and astronomy, mathematics, it may be you know what you need. You need three publications in XYZ journals. That should be either in your department procedures or some departments, you know, biology, for example, I don't know if physics and astronomy requires that they have MOUs, Memorandum of Understanding. When you're hired, you have an MOU which specifies what you've got to do. Okay? That trumps the department procedures because it will say, what does it say in your MOU? Most departments don't have those, but some do. That will outline the requirements. There should be a section in your personnel procedures that addresses scholarly contributions. Okay, this is where, here's a new section 600 rule. I hope I can keep you with me. It may get confusing. Up until last year, there was something in <coughs> Section 600 that was called equivalencies to publication. Section 600 no longer contains that phrase, but it hasn't gone away. So let me give you a little bit of history. Section 600 has a certain definition for publication. And it was fairly narrow the way it used to be written. For example, a book chapter wasn't counted as a publication just because it didn't fit on the specific definition. But departments, through their procedures, you're on 600, out of luck, sections define equivalencies to publication. That is, a book chapter counts as an equivalency to publication. So if it says three publications, and I've got two of the regular kind and one book chapter, I've got three, I'm done, because my department pr procedures said so. Where it was more evident was in the arts, and some of the departments that don't usually go the typical journal publication route is, what's acceptable as a scholarly work or an equivalency to publication in those departments. The departments would define those. I'm getting a nodding head here. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, one of the elements for these equivalencies was the concept of peer review, external peer review. If they said an article, just because you got published in Mad Magazine or something, if it wasn't peer reviewed, it wouldn't count. But it may be a presentation in art, a performance, a directorship. Some departments will take funded external grants as an equivalency to a publication. 
the difficulty came with the phrase equivalency to publication because some people didn't understand what that meant. They thought it was a lesser form of scholarship. I never had a problem because I kind of have an idea what equivalency means, equal, the same. <laughs> but some people thought it was lesser in some way. So to address that, PPNR took out that language. And if you go to section, no, I don't have these memorized, uh, 632.4.2, the equivalency language has disappeared. And now it's the department shall define what, what do they mean by scholarly work. One potential problem moving forward, though, even though that phrase is not in section 600, it's still in a lot of procedures that haven't been revised yet on that five-year cycle. So the phrase is going to be with us for a while because if a department had their procedures approved last spring, for example, they don't get them reviewed again for another five years. If they decide to take out the equivalency language then and put in new language, those don't go into effect for another three years. So we may hear this equivalency to publication for up to eight more years. In, but if you looked in the blue book, you wouldn't find it. So it's still lurking out there. Okay, the fourth area is contributions to the university and community. This has to do with the service question. I'm sorry, it's a general question regarding the competition. Mm -hmm. So I know just three years ago, you did journal competition and it's informatics. So does that have to be the first author? Or how much do we have to do it? Depends on your, depends on your, go back to your department procedures. Most articles these days are multi-author. Yeah. And this gets back to my, one of my initial points was tell your story. In my college, it's required, I think, that you have a cover sheet where you explain your role in the publication for multi-authored ones. First author is pretty self-explanatory. Second author, probably. Sometimes where it's a problem is if you're the last author, because in some disciplines and in some cultures, academic cultures, that's a position of respect. You're the lab director. And you're letting everybody else go ahead of you. So even though you're the last, you're one of the most important ones. But tell your story, say for a particular publication, what did you do? I designed the study, I collected the data, I wrote it, I edited it, whatever you did, whatever your responsibility was. So, uh, well, I think three publications, so we think you are always the first author, or maybe even an author, yeah. solo author, would be better than the one you are. No, because the expectation here is multi, is multi you know, you're going to have collaborators. Yeah. I mean, if you're sole author, you're sole author, slam dunk, done deal. <laughs> if there are multiple authors, say what your role was. What plays well here, in my experience, is if you have student co-authors. If they're involved in your research and your student is the first author, when, my, when I was doing mine, I underlined the names of all my students all the way through so they could see how my students were involved in everything I did. If it was a presentation or a publication, I wanted to say everything underlined and so they can get a feel for, whoa, you, you work with students a lot. I've heard of one discipline, I don't even know what it was, but they list the authors alphabetically. Oh, no. I'm whiting. <laughs> How did I ever get tenure? Right? <laughs> yeah. So, just my, my guidance and advice would be first check with your department to see what they want, but explain your role. You tell your story. Don't let somebody else tell it for you. There's some labs where the lab director is first author on everything. Even if the person only did 5% of the work, they want themselves first. I don't agree with that personally, but it happens. Okay, now when you're putting your PIF together, you should have an index within it. And look at someone else's for this index. The index is a summary of what's in there. A copy of that should be in your PATH. And you update your index every year. You also make sure that you have a current VITA in there as well and update that annually. Let's say that in your second year file, next year for most of you. You have an article and it's published. You put the whole article in there. Also, if you're doing things in a foreign language, uh, talk to your committees as do they want a translation or not. Sometimes that's possible, sometimes it's not. We've run into cases where the reviewing agencies can't read the article, so how are they supposed to judge it? Uh, and again, think of your audience going forward. Okay, when you come up for the next year, do you have to include that physical article again? The answer is no. It's in your index. It should be referenced in your letters from the dean and the college and the DPC and the chair. They should reference the articles for that year. They are now virtually included. You don't have to physically keep building a pile in there. Just put in the new stuff from that new year. 
You may hear others tell you, no, put everything in every year. You don't have to. Harry will tell you, if in your sixth year, when you go up for tenure and promotion, you feel psychologically or emotionally compelled to put everything back in for that sixth year, go ahead and do it, but you don't have to. Now, some colleges, I know my home college, uh, the current dean decided she wanted to kind of standardize things, which I think largely is a good thing. They provide the binders with the same marking on the side. I know when HHD comes to the office because they have this kind of maroony purple spine on it and the names are all printed in the same font and everything and they open them up and boy, they're there. They have a requirement that you put in a copy of your department procedures and your college procedures so anybody reading it won't have any doubt what you're being evaluated on. That's just that college's requirements. But basically you want to make it readable and realize that the further you wait, move away from your department, the less they're going to know about what you did. If I'm on PPNR, and PPR, PPNR only sees the appeal files, not all the files. But if I'm reading an appeal file on PPNR, and it's from art or math, I don't know a whole lot about art. I certainly can't draw. I can do a square, a rectangle. <laughs> Math I know a little bit about, but some of the other areas, I don't know what they're talking about. So imagine your file being read by someone outside of your discipline and say, does this still make sense? Not that you're going to water down the content, but say, are you providing a story for them? When you include something, make sure it's titled the same thing all the way through. Sometimes we'll get one where there's a title on the actual, actual published paper, and the title in the index is a little bit different for some reason. We're saying, is this the same thing? Make sure everything matches in the file. Okay, any questions? How are we doing on time? Five? I'm sorry if there's no question. No, don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. Well, Ask questions. The number three part here, I mean, as I said, the computation is not the important fact to the end. So mm -hmm. for the first three issues, I'm not sure if there's any questions. So I feel like that's the grand proposal, which is included in this one. You could. Yeah, some departments value just submitting grants. They will say, if you submit a grant, we, we value that as scholarly work. Some will say, don't even put it in unless it's funded. So you have to check with your department and see what your department procedures say. And, and I keep going back to this department thing, but that's the reality. See what your department wants in the procedures and the unwritten culture in your department. Even though it shouldn't come in, it does sometimes. Yeah. You can show those for professional development kinds of things, and whether you want to put that in teaching effectiveness or you want to put it in you know, contributions to the field kind of a thing, that's for you to decide. And sometimes things, these aren't distinct concrete wall separated topic areas. You may have something that is scholarly work and some form of service. Now, can you put it in both places? I would say yes, as long as you acknowledge that it's in both sections and you're not trying to double dip something. And tell your story, say, yeah, these, I put them in both places because da 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 da. Now in service to the university, early on you're probably, and some department chairs, protect their junior faculty from being on too many committees and stuff. Now once you get tenured, <laughs> good luck. You're almost de facto on the department personnel committee the next year. Um, Again, talk to your chair, start to find, because as the letters move from year two to year three to four, there's an expectation that you're becoming more involved with the university. You do not have to have, and as you may hear it to the contrary, but you do not have to have service at every level, college and university and department. It's the quality of the work that you do at whatever level you do it that is important. The university prefers that people do things on committees rather than being a member of a whole bunch of committees. And don't be afraid on the committee, say, yes, I organized this symposium, this workshop, da, 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 to distinguish yourself from the person who just was on the committee and came to the meetings and didn't say anything or do anything. Emphasize what you've accomplished. That's best in your best interest. Community service, some departments are really big on community service. In fact, they have it built into their department procedures. Others, less so. But there's some expectation that you're doing something outside of the university with your expertise. 
And again, that's department specific. Okay, any questions on that? Yeah. I'm wondering, um, of the five sections, I'm wondering if there was like one or two sections that were kind of lacking in the first year. How did that look like? Yeah. Um, and I've heard this from the provost, so I'm somewhat echoing him. He says, when you first come, you should know your stuff. You're not a tenure track faculty member still learning your field, even though you still learn things. You expect the expectation is you come in knowing what you're talking about. None of us knows everything, but you should know what you're talking about. In the first couple of years, there's not an expectation, it's great if you do, about standing teaching. Because for a lot of people, this is the first they've ever taught. I remember when I first taught, it was like, you know, all over the place. I don't know if I did a particularly good job or not, and my class thought more the back of me than the front of me because I didn't want to look them in the eye because they'd ask me a question I didn't know the answer to. <laughs> Got over that. But we want to see that you're an effective teacher and that you're working to become that. So there should be some evidence that you're better in year four than you were in year two, better in year six than you were in year four and that you're making strides. And if there's anything along those lines in your letters from any of the agencies that you're making efforts to address what they're talking about. If they say you need to be more assertive or if you need to ask more questions or learn the students' names or any of the umpteen things that you make as suggestions to improve your teaching, are you making efforts to do that? Uh, in terms of the scholarship, they don't expect you to come in and have four publications in the first year. Right? You may have none in the first year or even two. But they want to see progress. Is there a plan? Is there evidence that you're starting something? So in the first year or two, you may be just collecting data. You may have no graduate students for the first year or two. I didn't my first graduate student, master's students, for my third year on campus. I was kind of getting things going. And then I got more and more students involved over time. And it kind of rolled from there. So they're looking for progress. But they don't expect to be outstanding, excellent in everything the first year and stay the same. They're looking for know what you're talking about when you get here and then improve on all those areas. General statement. I don't know if that's helpful or not. But any other questions? Okay, we're just about out of time. I can see they're nodding. Let me check my list here one last time, make sure I didn't forget anything really. <coughs> uh, one last thing. I had mentioned that the contract, the CBA, is a contract between the CSU system, Cal State system, and CFA, the California Faculty Association. CFA is your representative on campus. Whether you're a member or not, they will represent you. I think campus-wide membership is somewhere around 50% on this campus. Some campuses are higher than that. Some campuses are lower. Uh, CFA is there for you. Uh, we have a really good, thankfully, good working relationship between the administration and faculty affairs and the provost and CFA on this campus. Some campuses, it's not quite so uh, agreeable. Uh, if you have questions or feel that any of your rights have been violated or you even have questions, contact CFA. They're here to help you. Uh, the regional rep's name is Blanca Castaneda. She's really good. Uh, the president right now is Nate Thomas. He's in CTVA. And they have various other people who are working as faculty rights representatives. And but if you have questions, CFA is a really good option. And I oftentimes refer faculty probationary and tenure who call my office, they call CFA. They'll yeah, help they you were, represent you. They were all, they came to NFO in August. You met them, they came um, in session. I, I would more likely steer you toward them than away from them. They, they do help. And sometimes they working with us can work things out. Because I have no problem talking to a dean or a department chair saying, okay, what's, what's going on here? And we try to work it out the best we can. My goal in life is to have no grievances in faculty affairs. <laughs> I don't think we'll ever reach that, but that's my goal. <laughs> if we can solve problems early and educate people as to what's going on, I'd rather have a quiet, happy life. So, any other questions? I think I've exhausted my time, hopefully not exhausted you yet. So, uh, for us to better ensure our PIP goes through, would you recommend that we uh, insert largely uncirculated and unmarked $100 bills, or <laughs> is that a good sufficient number, and I'm kidding on tape, a sufficient number of zeros to allow a person to comfortably retire. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. Ocean View, Montecito. 
know, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I may know him, but I'm not there. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And, uh,